we're going to be recording tonight's lesson and hopefully the other lessons from the rest of the meeting and putting them on the Gravel Hill website. Those of you who haven't gone there, uh, gravelhillchurchofchrist.com. And believe it or not, your, your website is one of the most popular congregational websites in the world. It routinely gets shut down because it has too many people visiting it each month. So it's, some, it's something to be proud of. So go look at it if you haven't. I was in Casa Grande, Arizona, preaching in a gospel meeting. And I believe it was the last night of the meeting. A guy walked up here just like Bradley did and said a little thing of a jig here on the pulpit. And I didn't know whether it was a bomb or what it was. <laughs> but anyway, after service, he told me it was a cell phone. And his wife and daughter lived in Washington, D.C. And they had their cell phone on. And so while I was preaching in Arizona, I was preaching also in Washington, D.C. And uh, it amazes me what this world of technology can do. And uh, I'm grateful for it. But I'm just as ignorant as I can be regarding it. I just don't know much about how to do it. We're grateful that you have come tonight. We've been talking about this morning, and we will through the end of this meeting, about the challenge that God has given us as his people to build a beautiful church to the glory of God. As I mentioned this morning, Jesus built his church, and then before he ascended back to the Father, he told us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, which in my language says that I am charging you with the responsibility of continuing what I have started. I want you to proceed with what I began. And so it is incumbent upon every one of us tonight, as children of God, to build a beautiful church to the glory of God. Paul wrote to those Corinthian brethren, as was read a few moments ago, and he said we need to take heed how we build. It is possible for us to build and not build in the right way. But we want to build according to the pattern which God has given to us in his word. Give, uh, we need to give attention to the regulations that there are revealed in the word of God as to how we are to build. So we take heed how we are to build. This morning we talked about building a beautiful church to the glory of God by edifying one another. Our relationships between us in the church must be right. There must be a spirit of edifying one another which exists among us, not tearing each other down, not disrupting the unity and the harmony and the peace of the people of God, by insisting upon having our way or in some other way hinder the building of the, God, of the church rather than contributing to it. Then we talked about in the worship hour some other things that we can do to help to build a beautiful church to the glory of God. Tonight I want us to think together about one of the most important things that we need to take uh, caution about and give attention to as the people of God and that is building a beautiful church to the glory of God by honoring our commitment to live a faithful Christian life. Listen, when you were baptized into Christ, you were not just joining a church like you would join a civic club or a social order. You were added by the Lord to his church. You were accepting a responsibility. We were making a vow to the Lord. We were making a promise to the Lord that we are going to be faithful in living for Jesus Christ. This isn't just a part-time duty. This, this isn't something that we just do uh, in an occasional way or in a casual way. 
I mean, when a person becomes a child of God, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. And that individual is making a commitment to God. And listen, we don't go about breaking commitments. We don't take our commitments lightly in this life. Oh, you say, I know a lot of people who do. And of course, that's right. I know a lot of people who make commitments and then break them without any thought whatsoever. But I'm talking about a commitment to God. Now, that's, that's something of far greater consequence than making a commitment to me. You may make a commitment to me, and it may not matter a great deal whether you keep it or you break it. But I'm talking about when a person realizes that I'm lost in sin, I'm separated from God because of my sins, I do not want to be lost, I want to be saved, Therefore, I repent of my sins. I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and am baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The Lord adds me to His church and I am in effect saying to the Lord, I belong to you. I'm your personal property. I'm going to be faithful to you regardless of what happens in this life. Now, in spite of all that, I believe that one of the uh, greatest concerns that most elders have and most preachers have and most others who are very concerned, one of the greatest concerns that we have is that large and ever-increasing number of members of the body of Christ who become unfaithful in serving the Lord. Barbara was teaching a, lady, a class of of children as she did for so many years. These were probably four years of age. And the next Sunday we were having what we were calling uh, family day. We wanted all of the family to come. We were going to have a great day. Of course, we're going to eat. That's, we always eat. So we're going to have this big family day. And a little boy sitting in the class said, my daddy won't come. He quit. Now I could tell you what's happened to that little boy and his two older brothers and his mother and father divorced. And yet his father, as we commonly say, was brought up in the church, but he quit. How sad and how heartbreaking. There is a magazine published through our brotherhood, it's called Church Growth Magazine. The emphasis is given to devising means and trying to uh, come up with some ideas about how to promote the growth of the church. And not long ago, in one issue of that magazine, they made this statement in one of those lessons. Two out of every five people who become Christians leave the church before they are five years old, spiritually speaking. Before they are in the church for five years, they forget about the commitment that they have made and they go back and begin to serve themselves and in effect serve Satan no longer honoring their commitment to faithfulness. Almost everywhere I go, somebody will come before the meeting is over and they'll say, you know, preacher, if we had every member of the church that's been baptized in this community to show up for service, our building wouldn't hold them. Just recently, some brethren did a study I, and you know, I don't pay much attention to some of these numbers that brethren come up with. And I'm not saying anything uh, negative about them, but I don't know how, how these studies are done and who does these studies and how they are operating and all this kind of stuff. But some brethren of ours did a study up in Craighead County, Arkansas, where Barbara and I both were raised. They tell me, 
That in Craighead County, that's where Jonesboro is the county seat. There are more than 5,000 people who have been baptized into Christ but are no longer serving the Lord. 5,000 who have failed to honor their commitment of faithfulness to the Lord. I don't know if that's true or not. I know if there's one, that's too many. Honoring our commitment to faithfulness. Listen, when I read figures like that, or when I think about someone who has not been faithful in serving the Lord, there are several things that come to my mind. We would not accept in our world some of the same situations that we do accept in the religious world. For instance, if somebody said to you that the hospital in Russellville lost two out of every five babies that were born before they were five years old, you'd be screaming your lungs out. Don't go to that hospital when you're going to have a baby. They, leave, they lose too many babies. We wouldn't stand for that. We'd be yelling at the uh, medical board, something's got to be done. But we can lose two out of every five children of God, and I don't know that if it bothers us all that much. Secondly, we need to realize that when people become children of God and then stop serving the Lord faithfully, they are lost. Now, it's not just a matter, well, our attendance is down because so many people have quit. It's not just a matter of, well, they, they aren't coming to services like they should or whatever, but, but everything's still okay when a person, listen, we often talk about, well, so-and-so quit the church, and that's the wrong terminology. When so-and-so quit, they quit the Lord. They may have quit attending services of the church, but when we make a commitment, a vow of faithfulness in serving the Lord, and we make a commitment that we're going to help to build a beautiful church to the glory of God through faithful Christian living, and then we don't do it, we've quit the Lord. And we're lost. And we need to do everything in our power to stop that. Well, what does the word faithful mean? I hear that word thrown around a lot. We talk about people who are faithful and people who are unfaithful and all of that. What does the word faithful mean? Well, it occurs 51 times in the American Standard Version of the New Testament. It means constancy, steadiness, reliability, dependability. Loyalty, trustworthiness. And so when you read your New Testament and you read this word faithful, just put in the place of that word faithful some of these words. Reliable, trustworthy, dependable, constant. That's what we're talking about. That's the word faithful. That's what it means. Webster says it means steadfast in keeping promises or fulfilling duties. We have duties that we're responsible to fulfill. We have promises we're responsible to keep. That's called faithfulness. Listen, I don't believe that we misunderstand the word faithful. I don't believe that we just don't have the ability to understand the word faithful. I believe there is an inerrant effort in our part or a lack of effort in our part to be faithful. We understand what it means. I, I, I think I would say tonight that if you don't really understand what the word faithful means, you're probably okay. If you don't understand what the Bible means when it talks about our being faithful stewards and so forth, as we'll talk about later on, then it, everything's probably all right anyway. The problem is we seem to have trouble making a personal, personal 
application of faithfulness to our own life. You know, I'd rather talk about somebody else's faithfulness or unfaithfulness as I had to talk about mine. Oh, I can sit in the church building and I can look around a little bit and look across the, the aisles at the pews on the other side and so forth and I can begin to look at the lives of other people and I can see people who, in my judgment, are not faithful and so forth. That doesn't do any good for me. What I need to do is open up the heart of old number one here, look down deep inside and measure the faithfulness of Ted. That's when some benefit will come. I don't believe we have a problem not understanding faithfulness. We have a problem of not applying it to ourselves personally, individually, and, and making the commitment to be faithful. Well, what does it mean to be faithful to Christ? Is this just a subject that we preachers get all excited about? And we jump up in the pulpit and beat everybody over the head about being faithful to the Lord? Or is this really, really an essential ingredient in building a beautiful church to the glory of God? Do you think it's really, really all that important that we be faithful to Christ? There seems to be many standards by which we try to determine the meaning of the word faithful. And so when I ask the question tonight, what does it mean to be faithful to Christ? That question may depend upon whom I ask. I may ask one person, are you a faithful Christian? Oh, yes. Yes, I am a faithful. My picture's in the church directory. And I'm a faithful member of the church. You may ask another person, and they make the, uh, about the same statement, express the same sentiment, but they never enlist in the work of the local church and involve themselves in it, never attend the services of the church, only uh, sporadically. They never give of their means. They never uh, participate in the work, and yet uh, faithful. I was talking to an elder, my lady and I, at our house not long ago. An elder was visiting in our home, and I asked him about a lady that we know who uh, supposedly attend services where he's an elder. And I asked him about this lady because I kept seeing on Facebook where all every weekend she was at a football game or a baseball game or some kind of thing with her 12-year-old son. And I asked uh, does this lady, and I called her name, does she attend services? And he said, well, she hadn't been there in several months. Well, what is she doing? Well, she takes her son. They're involved in, in baseball and football and all of this, and so they're always involved in that on the weekends, and uh, they, they don't come to service. And I said, well, wh what are you guys going to do? Are you going to visit? Are you going to talk to this lady? Are you going to, to try to reason with her? And he said, no, we might run her off. And I thought, run her off? From what? Mercy. You see, we all have these different ideas of what it means to be faithful. We have these different... Uh, well, we, we'll say... If a person attends services regularly, then that person's faithful. They may not give. They may not pray. They may not participate in the work of the Lord. They may not ever concern themselves with talking to somebody who isn't a Christian about what they need to do to be saved. All of these things that they never do, but they're there when the building's open. 
I was in a place in a meeting. One of the elders came to me and asked me about a man and his wife that had moved into our community. And he said, are they attending services there? I, I didn't know. Had, I'd never heard of them. And the only congregation of the Lord's church in that community was the one where I was preaching. So he said they'd moved there. And I, we'd never heard of them. He said, well, I'm not surprised. When they move away from here, they've done this two or three times, they move away from here, and they never get involved in the church. They don't even attend the services of church. When they move back here, they're just as faithful as they can be. Well, I decided here's a family that's not converted to Christ. They're converted to a local congregation. They like what's going on in that local congregation. They like the fellowship they have maybe with their friends in that local congregation. Listen. I'm talking about being converted to the Lord. Some people may be converted to a preacher. Ah, we need to be converted to the Lord. And when we are children of God, we need to be faithful to the Lord. Well, what does it mean to be faithful? I want to point you to one verse. And let's uh, kind of work this verse over a little bit. It's in John chapter 14. And the verse is 15. You already know what it says, probably. It's simple. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, what's the Lord saying here? He's dealing with the entirety of an individual. If you love me, that's dealing with my mind. That's dealing with my heart. That's dealing with what's inside of me. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's dealing with what I do. That's dealing with my actions. That's dealing with, uh, with the way I live from day, day to day. And so Jesus, in that one verse, is talking about the entirety of a human being. What is inside of that man and how, what that inside produces outwardly. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now what is the opposite of that? If you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. Is that right? That's got to be right. I'm talking about honoring the commitment that we made when we baptized. We repented of our sins. We confessed before people, whatever the number may be, that uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We got, we got into that baptistry. We were buried in that water for the remission of our sins. We came up out of that water as a child of God, having made a vow, having made a commitment that I belong to you, Lord. Have we kept that? Are we honoring that commitment? In Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, the Bible says that we are married to Jesus Christ. Married to the Lord. When you were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, you became married to the Lord. How have we kept that marriage vow? I've been stalking Barbara for 56 years. A little longer than that, really, because we started when she was 11 and I was 4. Or somewhere along in there. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I was seven and she was five. When our parents began to go home with each other from church and so forth and we worked in the cotton patch together and we went to school together and we went to, uh, we just, uh, and so I've been after her all these years. Married for 55. You see, we took those vows seriously. 
Blondie and Rex just celebrated their 50th. They were a lot older than we were when they got married. They'd be <laughs> married as long as we are. 50 years. They've honored their commitment. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing when we see people in the, this life who, who honor their commitment in marriage. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to honor our commitment to the Lord. We're married to Jesus Christ. What a great joy it is to be faithful to our vows. Turn over to Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What is there hard to understand about that? If any man come after me, first he must deny himself. That means you dethrone yourself and you enthrone Jesus Christ. He's first. He comes first in my life. If he doesn't, then he said, you cannot be my disciple. When a person becomes a Christian, seriously, genuinely becomes a Christian, that person belongs to Jesus Christ. You know, I may like to stick out my chest if I could without hurting my shoulder, and I'd say, I'm my own man. Mm-hmm. Not if I'm a Christian, I'm not. I belong to the Lord. I belong to the Lord. I've made a vow. I have made a commitment. And it's time for me to climb down off the throne and put Jesus Christ on the throne and to honor my commitment of faithfulness. There's another one, Matthew 6 and the verse is 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Anybody miss that? He establishes an order first. We don't misunderstand that in any other area of life. First. He designates an object, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he tells us, he makes a, a, a promise that if we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these things shall be added unto you. First. Again, I say, we don't have any problem understanding this. Many years ago, I was in a gospel meeting as a youngster at Bay, Arkansas, where Barbara and I grew up. Brother Guy N. Woods, one of the greatest scholars the church has ever known, was preaching in a gospel meeting. And he would announce, when he got up every night, he would say, for the next so-and-so minutes, I'll be speaking on the subject of, and he'd go on with his lesson. That night he said, for the next 26 minutes, I'm going to be speaking to you about first things first. Later, he published a book of sermons, and that's the second sermon, maybe the first sermon in that book. I've never forgotten it. I've got a lot of weaknesses and faults, but one of them is not a bad memory. I can preach that sermon tonight word for word just like he preached it that night. And what he did in that lesson was define a few things. And he took Matthew 6 and verse 33 and he, he preached this wonderful sermon from that, from that text. He talked about commitment. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That takes commitment. That takes loyalty. That takes dependability. That means that we're going to be steadfast and constant and trustworthy. That's what it means. 
Okay. Why should I be faithful to Christ? Why? We understand what faithfulness is. We know what it means to be faithful to Christ. Why should I do that? I am responsible as a builder of the kingdom of God. I'm responsible as a child of God to build a beautiful church to the, to the glory of God. Why is it all that important? In Matthew 25, Jesus talked to us about the Men to whom he gave talents. One of them received five, one of them received two, and one received one. He went away, the master did, and when he returned, the man who had received five talents said, Lord, here are the five talents and five others that I've gained. What did the Lord say to him? Blessed, faithful servant. The second man came with his two talents. Here are the two, and here are two others. The Lord said, he's a faithful servant. But the old boy that received one came, and he said, Lord, here's your talent. I didn't use it. I didn't abuse it. I didn't get it all dirty and filthy or anything. Of that. Here, here it is, Lord, just like it was when you gave it to me, well, what the Lord say? Well, bless your heart. It doesn't really matter. No, the Lord said, cast out this unprofitable servant where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's of no value. He is of no benefit in building a beautiful church to the kingdom of God because he has not used what he had as the master required. You think it's just something that we can casually dismiss? Is it just something that doesn't really make all that much difference? We better get this right down here, folks. It'll be too late, late to try to get it right in, in judgment. It'll be too late to try to get up to the judgment seat of Christ and they debate with the Lord or offer our arguments and all of that. That'll all be done. We're doing that right now. We better get this thing right about our faithfulness in serving the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the verse 2 verses. Paul said, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And look at that. He didn't say, I suggest or I recommend that a steward be faithful. He said, it is required in stewards, that a man be found faithful. Our eternal destiny rests upon our being faithful in serving the Lord. I get church bulletins. Through the years, I've gotten off of the mailing list of several that I just didn't want to get anymore. Because I, listen, as I mentioned this morning, I need all the help I can get to do good and to build up. I don't need any help making a mess. I can do that good. And I don't need any help to be discouraged. I can get down there myself too. I need, so I would get all these church bulletins. Here's a congregation that have 350 on Sunday morning for worship and had 225 in Bible study and Sunday night they had 180 and Wednesday night 150 or 60 people. Faithful? Hmm. It is required. It's not a suggestion. Revelation chapter 2 and the verse is 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Do you understand that? Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. We read Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And we've talked about our denominational friends. If that said, he that believeth and is baptized shall receive a thousand dollars. Everybody be lined up to get in the line before the baptistry. Well, 
Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. And we kind of let that slide off the side. But our receiving a crown of life, brothers and sisters, is dependent upon our being faithful in serving the Lord, in helping to build a beautiful church to the glory of God. The Bible is filled with examples of people who were faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. My lady and I read the New Testament through in the month of January, in part of February, I guess. Then uh, we've been reading the Old Testament through. We're now in chapter 31 of the book of Job. I think I put on Facebook the other day, there isn't a sensible human being on this earth that can read from Genesis at least to Job 31 and deny that obedience to the will of God is demanded. It is demanded. The Bible is filled with examples of that. But God is faithful, the Bible says, Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 1 Corinthians 10 13. God is faithful. Christ is faithful, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Galatians 3 verse 9 reminds us of the faithfulness of Abraham. Hebrews 3 verses 1 and 2 talks about the faithfulness of Moses. The apostle Paul wrote about himself. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation and so forth. These were faithful. They set the pattern for us. Well, how do we determine if we're faithful or not? Could I ask you four questions and you just answer them in your own heart? Am I faithful in saving the lost? We got seven billion people in this world and we're going to talk about some more of that on Tuesday night. They need to be saved. Most of them never heard a gospel sermon. Most of them never held a Bible in their hands. They've never heard about Jesus Christ coming into the world and dying for their sins and building a church into which they may be added by him upon obedience to the gospel and they could serve him faithfully and go to heaven when they die. They don't know that. And while they are lost, we're so busy in a lot of instances fussing back and forth over things that make not one hill of beans of sense. I don't know if Bradley saw it, but I did. This week on one of the sites that uh, we talked back and forth on. Somebody asked this week, have you ever called anybody down from the pulpit? When you saw somebody misbehaving, have you ever called them down out of the pulpit? And so preachers began putting... Uh, their responses on that. Some said we need to call them down. We need to do it in a nice way. Some said you don't need to do that. And all of these different things. But one or two guys decided, hey, we need to get it done because young people not paying attention, texting, and you know, they used to write notes. They don't do that anymore. Now they text. And all of this kind of that is sin, they said. It's sinful. And that's got to be stopped. Well, I wondered when I read that, Bradley, how long are we going to do till we'll draw a line of fellowship? And if we see somebody in the church building with a telephone texting or whatever, we'll just withdraw fellowship from them. Not a faithful Christian anymore. Oh, while we're arguing about stuff like that, seven billion people in the world are lost. And are we doing anything about it? Surely. Surely we can see that. Are we faithful in giving of our means? Are we faithful in attending the services of the church? Are we faithful in Bible study and in prayer? Are we faithful in our support of the elders as they lead the flock and guide the flock and feed the flock and all of the duties that uh, they have? It's not hard if we'll just be honest with ourselves for us to determine whether we're really faithful or not. And I again tonight, I'm not suggesting for one moment that we begin to measure the faithfulness of one another. 
I don't want anybody in this building to look over at somebody else and say, well, I'm a, uh, that person's not faithful because they don't do things like I do it and all of that kind of thing. I, I, I'm challenging each one of us tonight in this building to open up our own hearts and look down deep inside and say to ourselves, am I honoring my commitment to be faithful to Jesus Christ? That's the only way we'll ever build a beautiful church to the glory of God is when we make our commitment to the Lord of faithfulness and when we die by it. I mean, we don't quit. We don't lose our faith. We don't lose our hope. We don't give up. Building a beautiful church to the glory of God. That demands our attention, and that demands our participation. That demands our prayer. And about every other good thing that you can possibly think of tonight. But there's something else. If you're not a Christian tonight, you need to be obedient to the gospel and allow the Lord to add you to the church and begin to live a faithful life. Not a sinless life, not a perfect life, but a faithful life. A faithful life. And if you're already a child of God and you've not been serving the Lord faithfully, there's some correction you need to make in your life tonight. It's important. Your eternal destiny depends upon whether you're keeping your commitment, honoring your commitment of faithfulness to the Lord or not honoring it. And if you've not been honoring it and you need the prayers of the brethren with you and for you that your life might be made right, then we encourage you to come tonight, whatever your need, while we stand together and sing.